Good evening, everybody. So this is going to be a little bit uh, confusing for me on a couple of levels. Uh, I've been the audiovisual guy for all the uh, London lectures uh, this season. So it's been very easy for me just hand handling the computer, switching the slides. And so tonight I've got to do all of that. So we're going to have a little fun with that. Uh, so I appreciate your patience on that. And normally I would uh, ask at this point uh, Father Simeon, uh, the director of religious education to introduce the speaker, but uh, I'm not going to have him do that tonight. <laughs> uh, so we are going to be uh, talking about prayer and fasting. It's a good uh, subject to close out our Lenten lecture series on. Uh, we've had some incredible topics uh, this year, which I invite everyone to go online on our YouTube or our, uh, website to check them out. Uh, by chance, and I mean that sincerely, by chance, this lecture could not be more perfect for its date. Uh, because we are in the new day, uh, as you heard Father Simeon uh, mention during uh, his apologies uh, tonight, uh, during the pre-sanctified liturgy. But the one of the primary saints that we celebrate tomorrow, i.e. tonight, today, is St. John of the Ladder. And St. John of the Ladder is a quintessential part of what we are going to discuss. And we're going to get right into that by reading the gospel passage of, uh, of his Sunday. And this is from all three of the Synoptic Gospels. It's a very important uh, miracle, and as such, Anything that is that critical is in all three of the synoptic gospels. Synoptic meaning the same seen optic uh, eyes. And this is a story about a father who brings his demon-possessed son. Uh, in the Greek it says Selini, so basically like moonstruck. Uh, some people translate that as um, having epilepsy, uh, having seizures. Uh, but of course, within Holy Scripture, nothing is placed there by chance, nothing is placed there coincidentally. Uh, as we'll get into later in the lecture, there are many, 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 many miracles of Jesus Christ. Not all of them are in the Scriptures. The ones that are in the Scriptures are there for a specific reason to teach us something very, very important. And this is a quintessential lesson for us. So at that time, a man came to Jesus kneeling and saying, Teacher, I brought my son to you. For he has a dumb spirit, and wherever it seizes him, it dashes him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. And I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And he answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, he immediately convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, How long has he had this? And he said, From childhood. And it has often cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have pity on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, If you can, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You dumb and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out, and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he rose. And when he entered into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? He said, This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer and fasting. So there are a couple of elements here that are very, very important here. Uh, this boy represents all of us. All of us are this child. And that's why this is placed here specifically for us. Because prayer and fasting is something that is necessary not just for this father, not just for this boy, but it's necessary for all of us. And the reason why we know that this is necessary for all of us is because Jesus Christ told the Father, if you believed, if you had faith, you wouldn't need me. You could do this yourself. You could take care of this issue yourself. But of course, the Father doesn't believe. He doesn't have that faith. But he wants to have that faith. And so he cries out, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And so 
The fathers of the church, particularly uh, the Blessed Theophilact, look at this uh, demon possession as an allegorical message. And so we see that the demon is trying to kill the boy in two separate methods. So the first method is through fire. And so while fire is a tool, when it is out of control, it is unwieldy and dangerous. And so you see the two examples here of a candle with a wick that is too long, how the fire is moving about, and a candle where the wick is measured. It's a controlled flame. When the fire is out of control, it can cause a great fire and it can cause immolation, which is what we see in the picture below. Now, converse that, of course, with the fire of Pentecost. We see that the fire of Pentecost, which is filling the holy disciples, is still measured. Even though it is the uncontainable spirit, even though it is full of the gifts that are being given to the disciples, still it is shown in measured flames. These aren't like the disciples are birthday candles with the <laughs> fires just kind of sitting over them. They are full to the brim of the Holy Spirit, but it is controlled. It is measured. It is intentional. And so the fire, in this case, the way that the demon is trying to kill the boy, and by uh, allegory us, is the passions. And so the fire represents the seven deadly passions, which the latter divine ascent terms them as mother sins. And so we see them as pride, lust, greed, envy, sloth, wrath, gluttony. But when we read the Ladder of Divine Ascent, and this is one of the reasons why we have the icon there, St. John of the Ladder is very, very precise in that he names daughter sins of these great passions, of these terrible sins. And this is important for us, and this is one of the reasons why when we go to confession, sometimes the priest will ask you questions about your sin, because what is happening is we're giving the priest symptoms. We're giving him evidence that something is wrong inside of us. And what the priest is trying to do is get to the heart of the matter, which of these terrible menaces is actually afflicting you? What is actually harming you? And so these passions can run out of control. Any single one of them can destroy us. We can be destroyed by pride, by lust, by greed, envy, sloth, wrath, gluttony. Any of these, when out of control, can destroy us. Converse that with water. Water is essentially death by fear. And why is it fearful? Because we don't understand it. Water is formless. It is chaos, random, dark unknown, contains hidden creatures and dangers. If you look at ancient paintings when they have sailors, they put up monsters, creatures of the dark, things that they don't understand. And so it was the understanding that anything that is in the depths of the ocean is frightening, terrible, terrifying. We don't know what's in there, and therefore it is frightening and can kill us. which is realized through anxiety. Anxiety shows its form in stress, and that is found in our worries, whether it's our family, our jobs, our friends, our responsibility. How many of you have in your life said, I'm drowning. I literally can't take on another thing. I'm struggling. Well, this is important because we are full of anxiety. And we see the antithesis of this in Jesus Christ when he is doing what with water? Walking on water. He's walking on top of the water. He's able to rise above and step above and beyond our anxieties. And just as he said to the demon-possessed boy, what did he say to Peter? Come walk with me. Meaning that we too have the power to walk on top of our anxieties, to walk without fear without stress, trusting in God. 
But the demon is trying through these two antipodes to kill us, whether through our passions to make our passions raise out of control, or through our anxieties to make us drown in our worries. And all of us through our lives can probably relate to this a little bit. All of us have struggled with various passions, with worries, with stress. This is something that we've dealt with, like the little boy, from childhood. Now, if we had faith, we would be able to rid ourselves of these things. Jesus Christ says, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. Because oftentimes, our stress, our worries, our passions, they seem great and giant like mountains. But, clearly, we don't have faith. We're just like the father of the boy, saying, I believe, help my unbelief. So this is how he is trying to destroy the child. And this is important for us to understand, because what we're looking at here is that this is not just our normal life. We're not dealing with just... Oh, well, that's just life. What we're dealing with is our enemy, the enemy who wishes to keep us from God. For we wrestle not against... Oops. Change the slide for those online. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness in this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So... Who can tell me what a principality is? What's a principality? It's a rank of angel. It's a rank of angel, but specifically, what does it do? Does anyone know what a principality does? So a principality is the rank of angel that is specifically in charge of a group of people. So there is a principality angel that's in charge of our community of St. Andrew. There's a principality, that angel that's in charge of the city of Chicago, in charge of the, city, the state of Illinois. There's a principality, angel, that's given charge over your marriage. When the priest says, and may an angel go before you all the days of your life. So these are the angels that help organize people and places. Now, for every angel, there's an inverse, a demon. And so what's a principality demon trying to do? cause division. So earlier before the lecture, Padre Skava was talking to me about the saints that were mentioned in today's uh, readings and how they were brutally tortured. He could not believe the inhumanity of the state that would kill people in such a horrible way. We're talking people that were put into a device with like a wooden screw and then their body squished by the plates and then also bored with like a corkscrew. I mean, this is nasty stuff. And where does these thoughts come from? Principalities. Powers. What, does it, what is a power? In fact, we just sang about it on Monday. Lord of the powers. So what is a power? No. It's a type of angel. And what do powers do? Powers are the angels that do miracles. Powers are the angels that perform great feats. On another time, we can go through all nine ranks of angel, because I, I, uh, the celestial hierarchy, uh, as written by uh, St. Dionysius, is where we understand the majority of this. But so a demon power is a demon that is causing horrific things to happen. And so the idea is that we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. So we're not wrestling against people. My enemy is not any person. It is demon kind, the darkness in spiritual high places. Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in evil days and having done all to stand. This is the epistle uh, that shows us that we are called to stand against wickedness, against evil, because this is where the passions come from. This is where the anxiety comes from. It is spiritual warfare. And so the way we do this is with prayer and fasting. And so our first kind of prayer is corporate prayer. Corporate prayer, where two or three are gathered in my name, from Matthew, we are the body of Christ, and so we pray together. In the early church, there used to be a saying from Tertullian, unis Christianus, nullus Christianus. Oh, darn it, Father Simon's here, I was going to say, and Father Simon will probably correct my terrible Latin. <laughs> 
<laughs> Which probably some happened. others that are even better. <laughs> <laughs> but the translation of that is what Christian is no Christian. And this would cause a lot of uh, various sects of Christianity to get upset with Orthodox whenever we would go to uh, interfaith dialogues because they would always get upset by the Orthodox theologians that would always say, we believe, we believe. And they say, well, what about you? It's like, there is no me. <laughs> It is the church. We believe in this. It is not my personal credo. It is the church. And so it is the body that we all together believe. And this is said many times throughout the liturgy. With one voice and one heart, let us say, no one can be genuinely a Christian in isolation. We are saved not alone, but as members of the body of Christ in union with all other members. Uh, this is from Metropolitan Callistos of the Aplia. I appreciate your patience. I'm essentially doing this slideshow three times, once for the people online, once for you, and once for me to read. <laughs> so the second kind of prayer, and I'm going to go backwards a couple pages on that, is private prayer. We think we know best, and so we want to take the training wheels off and say, I pray, but we need to know learn how to pray. And what do I mean by that? Why do we need training wheels on how to pray? Jesus uh, don't get ahead of me. <laughs> okay. Okay, there we are. So the second kind of prayer is private prayer. What are we really praying for? To win the lottery or a game? <laughs> to take from us pain and suffering? And so this is an example of you know, where we don't really know what we have to pray. So if you ask a 10-year-old in a peewee uh, soccer game, what, pray, what prayer are you going to pray before the game? They win. <laughs> I want to win. Whereas what should the prayer have been? Keep us safe. May we all play to the best of our ability. May we make new friends. Uh, you know, may we grow together as athletes. May we perform our best. Uh, winning should be secondary. It should not be part of the prayer because that kind of prayer is egotistical. By that same token, when we say take, the, take from us pain and suffering, obviously, yes, we do pray. But what if that pain and suffering leads to our salvation? What if we become stronger, better people because of the trials that we've endured? Would you really take yourself away from that? There are many people that have suffered great, terrible things, but then they'll tell you, I would not trade it for anything because it made me who I am. It gave me the resilience. It gave me the strength. It gave me the assurance of my love in God. You can't take that from me. I would not have been able to do it without the struggles that I endured. And this gets to, yes, the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> and I put the, just the one line, thy will be done, and I'm going to pair it in a moment with the, the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. But what's really important about the Lord's Prayer is that every line of the Lord's Prayer is an archetype of prayer. When they ask Jesus Christ, how do we pray? What's the, what's the way we should pray? And Jesus Christ basically said this to them after, and this is said on uh, the Saturday before Forgiveness Sunday, uh, don't be like the hypocrites with their long prayers and their empty words or standing on street corners or rather go into your room and pray in secret so that your father who sees you in secret will reward you and then they asked him okay how do we pray and then he gave us the Lord's Prayer which is one of the most important powerful prayers in Christendom not just because Jesus Christ gave it to us but because every line of the Lord's Prayer is Sort of like the canon of faith. It's almost like a, it's, a, it's like its own little noodle test. Does anyone know what the noodle test is? So the noodle test, and this is going to drive culinary people up a wall, is where you boil spaghetti, and if it sticks to the wall, then you know it's ready. Oh, that's beyond the Dante. No, 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 no. But. But it is an expression when used to test things against what we call the canon of faith, against the wall here of uh, the church, is that does it match up? 
Does my prayer match up? If you look at every hymn, every prayer within Scripture, within uh, the church, with every service, every single one of them will match up against one of the lines inside the Lord's Prayer without exception. It is the divine archetype. If your prayer does not match up against the Lord's Prayer, chances are, like, can I win the lottery or <laughs> I want to win the game? It's probably not the right prayer. And one of the key lines in that Lord's Prayer, which is the critical juncture for us, is thy will be done. And this is one of the elements. Uh, Father Simeon touched on this a great deal. Uh, and so did uh, Nico when we were talking about the uh, heresy of monoenergism and monothelitism uh, was the idea that God, this is the heresy, that God only had one will or one energy. Well, the one will, the monothelitism, is put to rest by this moment. Because in this moment, Jesus Christ is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, if it is possible, take this cup away from me. What cup is he talking about? Hmm? Crucifixion. crucifixion. Not just crucifixion. His, his, crucifixion. his crucifixion, his scourging, his mocking. <laughs> like, like we're talking torture here. We're talking uh, one of the most brutal executions possible. So he was so anxious in this moment in the garden that it says that sweat was coming off his brow like droplets of blood. Now, I've talked to some theologians that say that it doesn't mean that he was sweating blood, but that actually is a medical condition that if you are hyper anxious, you can actually sweat blood. It basically means that you're on the verge of a heart attack, uh, but that's the kind of anxiety that you're dealing with. Um, so this prayer is sincere. When he's asking God, the Father, please don't let me have to go to this brutal, horrible, torturous end, it is a legitimate prayer. It is Jesus Christ's humanity praying as a natural prayer for us not to want to go to torture, death, and pain. But he immediately follows it up with, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Now, this is important for us. It's critical for us. Because what it shows us is what Jesus is doing with his human will is he is making it subservient to his divine will. And that's what we are supposed to do. We are supposed to yoke our will to God's will to say, yeah, I have desires, I have wants, but not my will, thy will be done. And this is made a little more evident as well uh, with in one of my favorite morning <laughs> prayers, uh, the prayer of Metropolitan Philaret of Moscow. Lord, grant me to greet the coming day in peace. Help me in all things to rely upon your holy will. In every hour of the day, reveal your will to me. Bless my dealings and with all who surround me. Teach me to treat all that shall come to me throughout the day with peace of soul and with firm conviction that your will governs all. In all my deeds and words, guide my thoughts and feelings. In unforeseen events, let me not forget that all things are under your care. Teach me to act firmly and wisely without embittering and embarrassing others. Give me strength to bear the fatigue of the coming day and all that it shall be. And this last line is why I consider this one of my favorite prayers because this is germane to the point of thy will. Direct my will, teach me to pray, pray yourself in me. Meaning that we recognize, just like that man in the, uh, the gospel passage, we don't, we don't have it. We need help. And Christ our God can give us that help. Which brings us to what I consider the weakest link of uh, orthodoxy. <coughs> Personal prayer. <laughs> we orthodox were really good with our formulaic prayers and our corporate prayers, but... We forget that this is supposed to be a personal relationship with God, your Savior. And so this is one of the elements where a lot of our Protestant brethren have us beat because they actually engage in daily dialogue with God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. And we, by and large, in the Orthodox world, forget this. This is that simple prayer that is just between you and God. 
This is where the private prayer transforms our prayers into more meaningful conversations with God. Because prayer is a conversation. And this is why the private prayer is important, because otherwise we'd be praying willy-nilly for things that don't matter. Whereas our personal prayer should be reflective of our relationship with God. And unfortunately, too often, when does personal prayer usually start to come in for people? When people get sick, when people are struggling, when people are having a crisis, and they forget, oh wait, did I have a relationship with God? <laughs> have I talked to God before this? Have I had a relationship with him before this? You will notice that for a lot of people that have that personal conviction, that personal relationship with God, they weather crises a lot better than people that don't. Now granted, sometimes God uses that crisis moment to bring that person to hit the rock bottom, to bounce back, to get that relationship with God, and then it becomes deep, then it becomes meaningful, then it grows, it's beautiful. But it is supposed to be a relationship. It is supposed to be something that allows us to deeply talk to God, to ask Him questions, to tell Him about the good things, the bad things, everything about us. Because God is supposed to be our friend. He said, I'm not speaking to you as your master anymore. I'm speaking to you as your friend. We call each other brethren, meaning brothers and sisters in Christ. How in the world are we His friends? How in the world are we close to Him if we have no relationship with Him? If it's just standoffish, then where's our relationship? Going back to our private prayer, the very first line of the private prayer, that the model of all prayers, what's the first line of the Lord's Prayer? Our, our Father, which shows us right out of the gate, this is personal. This isn't God on the mountain up high, El Shaddai, the original way that God revealed himself to us. This is our Father. And so this is supposed to be a relational prayer. We need all three types of prayer in our lives continuously. So even in the monastic uh, fathers, who are oftentimes, many of them were uh, hesychasts. That would be basically meaning that they were by themselves in, in prayer and silence. And many of the monasteries during Great Lent would take on that role even if they were Cenobitic, meaning that they were part of a community. But they would always come back for corporate prayer. So they would oftentimes, they would leave after uh, Forgiveness Sunday, they'd come back Palm Sunday for corporate prayer. They would pray the, the rules of prayer, and they would engage in their personal reflections in prayer. All three prayers are vitally important to us. Now, obviously, we would argue that you need to master corporate and private prayer to inform your personal prayer. But this is one of the reasons why when we talk to children, we engage them where they're at. We help raise them up so that they can understand. So even if their personal prayer is not perfect, we say, that's fine, that's good. You know, for example, as we talked before about icons, we don't kiss icons in the face, because as it says in uh, one of the prayers, I shall not give you a kiss as to Judas. Nevertheless, if a little baby girl or a little baby boy kisses uh, Christ on the cheek, are we going to say, no, 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 no. We're going to just be happy that the child is kissing the icon and developing a relationship. Which brings us to fasting. Before a fight, boxers will fast. This makes the synapses in the brain fire faster. You want to react as quickly as possible in the arena. Because as we said, we're not wrestling against people. So for example, anyone here an athlete? Or former athlete? What would happen to you if you ate a big plate of spaghetti before a game? <laughs> You'd be sluggish. Well, not just sluggish. You're liable to puke. You're liable to get <laughs> hamstrings. Uh, you will have a terrible performance. Uh, it's a bad idea to eat super, super amounts of food. You can eat the day before. But if you eat a bunch, bunch, bunch of food, you're going to throw up. And I can uh, tell you for myself as a runner that when I run, if I have food in my stomach, not a fun thing. <laughs> there are runners that will you know, have protein bars or things like that because they want to make sure that they're keeping their, their levels up. But if you eat too much, forget it. It's not good. Okay. <laughs> 
So perhaps the greatest example of what happens to us when we overeat is Thanksgiving. We become tired, sleepy, and active. Uh, by and large, we are sitting on the couch going, uh, who's playing? Great. <laughs> because it, it's not just the tryptophanes of the, uh, the turkey, which helps with that, but it's the idea that we gorge, we eat too much. And this is a problem, especially within our fasting culture, because typically in the early days of the church, what were people eating? What was the average diet of the average Christian? Beans, vegetables, sometimes a little shellfish. Olives, bread. Notice what word you didn't say? Meat. So typically, when would you have meat during the time of Christ? Holidays. Big parties. Only the exceptionally wealthy could afford meat. Everyone else subsided basically on vegetables. So our normal fasting fare was the normal fare of the day, which meant what was the purpose of fasting during the time of Christ and during the time of the early church? No celebrating. So what do we oftentimes see during fasting periods? We are not eating meat. What are we doing with that spaghetti? We're gorging. <laughs> we go to uh, parties and we see Tra trays and trays of lobsters and uh, shrimps, and that completely defeats the purpose. I cannot remember which father said this, and maybe Father Simeon or, or Nicholas can uh, remind me of this, but they said basically that a good fast would be you can take one more bite, but you don't, so that you're just a little bit hungry. You, if you take just one more bite, you're full, but you don't take that last bite. How many of us, we get to that last bite, it's like, oh, I can't even take another bite. Dessert? <laughs> Just a few more bites. And then afterward you feel, like, this was a mistake. This was a mistake. <laughs> and that's the purpose. Again, it's so that we're sharp. It's so that we're ready to be able to do battle. Now, why is that important? Because what does fasting teach us? Be disciplined. How do we control that fire? Discipline. We control our passions with discipline. How can I say no to anger, to lust, to pride? I cannot say no to my stomach. This is one of the reasons why St. John of the Ladder begins a lot of the journey with fasting of food. Because it's about learning to have control over the passions. By that same token, how do we control anxiety and worry? <coughs> Faith. 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 I can't remember if it was Father Simeon or um, Dr. Helen that uh, quoted from Scripture, perfect love casts off fear. How do you develop perfect love? A relationship. When you know your God, when you love your God, are you afraid anymore? You're not afraid. You can walk on that water. You can defeat that anxiety because you have assurance, because you Prayer develops that relationship, develops that love. Fasting develops that self-control to deal with that passion. With these two things together, we are able to deal with the fire and the water. We are able to develop faith. We are able to develop belief. And what does that mean that can happen to the demon that's assaulting us daily? We can take care of it. And ultimately, it's not us taking care of it, of course. It's Christ taking care of it. But... It develops our faith. It allows us to be able to do the things that we need to do. I probably should have had this slide on the, uh, on the board when I was talking about that. Uh, this is a famous icon of a monk who is being shot at by the seven uh, deadly passions. And it is showing the crucified life of the monk, the monastic, of which Father Simeon is one. Uh, is in basically at war with the passions, with the slings and arrows of the evil one. So when you hear on Mondays during Great Lent and on Fridays uh, from part of the Compline service that protect me from the, the arrows of the darts of the evil one who are insidiously, insidiously hurled against me, this is what we're talking about. The arrows and the slings of the passions. 
So as a slight addendum to this, because um, sometimes we forget uh, what we're supposed to be doing, Scripture is not study. People get upset and they say, oh, I don't know Scripture, I should study Scripture more. It's like, you don't study Scripture. Scripture is supposed to be prayer. St. John Chrysostom states in his homilies that no man can excuse himself from reading a scripture and call himself a Christian because we are all a royal priesthood. And so therefore, before we begin to read scripture, which should be a prayer in and of itself, this is the prayer that the priest reads, but you also should be reading it before you do your daily reading of scripture. Shine within our hearts, loving master, the pure light of your divine knowledge, and open the eyes of our minds that we may comprehend the message of your gospel. How many Christian denominations are there? Over 70,000. And a lot of that is because people have their own interpretations, their own ways of reading scripture, their own ways of understanding things. And we're going to get to in a way of how we're supposed to do it. But through prayer, we're asking God. There is, there is a particular way that we're supposed to interpret this. It's not supposed to be my way. It's supposed to be the church's way. And by church, I don't mean little c, I mean big c. Not Father Dimitri way, not Father Simeon way, the church's way. Instill in us also the reverence for your blessed commandments, so that having conquered sinful desires, we pursue a spiritual life, thinking, doing all these things that are pleasing to you. For you, Christ our God, are the light of our souls and bodies, and to you we give glory together with your Father who is our beginning, and your all holy good and life giving spirit, now and forever and to the ages of ages. Amen. So when the priest is sensing during the epistle, while uh, the, the readers are reading the epistle, this is the prayer that the priest is reading, basically preparing himself, and by extension, all of you, to understand the message of the gospel. So before we ever read scripture, we need to pray. So as an example for this, if I have animus uh, against somebody and I'm reading scripture, guess what's going to happen? All that animus is going to come forward in the scripture. And I'll be like, aha, this is for my dad. He should read this. <laughs> so reading the Bible is prayer. It is not a study. And as I said earlier, from this is from John. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written, everyone, I suppose, the world itself could not contain the books that we've written. So one of the biggest pet peeves I have from people is, well, where is that written in the Bible? <laughs> the Bible itself tells you there's more. <laughs> Holy tradition and scripture are tools for our salvation. Scripture is a textbook unto salvation. It is not a history book. It is not the definitive story of Jesus Christ, because if it was, we'd have problems because there are discrepancies. Even though the synoptic gospels are called synoptic, same vision, there's discrepancies. Did Jesus Christ give his famous sermon on the mount? Did he give it on a boat? Did he give it in a level place? How many people did Peter deny Christ to? <laughs> Again, that's not the point. It's not a historical record. It's a textbook for salvation. Everything that is in there is there for specific purpose and reason. So how are we supposed to interpret Scripture? As I said, through, this is the last slide, so I apologize for if I took too long on this, uh, through the church itself. So Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. So in Acts of the Apostles, this kind of tells us how we're supposed to interpret things, the uh, Ethiopian eunuch is reading from the prophecy of Isaiah, and he's reading the same prayers that the priest reads when he is doing the proskumidhi, talking about the Lamb of God. And Philip is, is whisked there by the Holy Spirit, and he hears him reading it out loud. And he says, do you know what you're reading? And the eunuch says, unless it's interpreted for me, how am I supposed to know? Because he said, who is this about? Is this about the author? Is it about somebody else? And Philip told him. And so Philip got into the chariot and started explaining the scripture to the eunuch. And then the eunuch saw a pond and said, hey, there's water. What prevents me from being baptized? So the church interprets scripture, not us. And by that same token, one of the biggest authors of the New Testament is St. Paul, right? Now, in one of St. Paul's letters, he reveals a very important truth. Which of the 12 disciples who were direct relations of Christ taught Paul? 
Jesus. No. Nope. It was a simple priest. He didn't meet. He didn't even meet James until he'd already been taught for two years. He had already been working in the vineyard for a number of years before he met Peter and the rest. Which tells us something. It tells us that scriptural and authority within the church doesn't come from a person. The truth is the truth. Orthodoxy is orthodoxy. It comes from the church itself, not from the particular person. That's why Paul says many times, did Peter baptize you? Did Paul baptize you? No, you were baptized in Christ's name, not my name. And so these are the elements. It's just the tip of the iceberg of what Orthodox spirituality shows us about prayer and fasting. And I included the addendum about Scripture because Scripture I would uh, classify as, as a type of prayer. Uh, so I appreciate your patience. And if anyone has any questions, I'd be willing to field a couple. Going back to the pain and suffering, so we're not supposed to pray that God takes the pain and suffering from us, right? But it's natural for us as a thing. Well, here's the thing. No, because you, you ask, she asked, is it it's not okay for us to, to pray for pain and suffering to be taken away? I would say no, that's not true. Christ himself prayed that. Oh, so but, it's okay. but he followed it up with, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will. So in other words, we're supposed to pray that our suffering does get taken from us. However, if it's not for us to recognize that it is God's will and to be able to bear it, whatever that might be, whatever that cross is that we have to bear. So there's nothing wrong with praying for it, but it's also understand that it's not because of your lack of faith or because, oh, you just didn't pray strong enough for it. It's to understand that, yes, we pray that suffering is uh, taken away. For example, we're all praying for uh, Father Angelo right now. Um, we're praying for a miracle. But nevertheless, we say, thy will be done. We're hoping that his will is to, to save and to heal him. So there's nothing wrong with praying for these things, but acknowledging and accepting that sometimes the answer might not be what we want. Beginning, why did Christ ask the Father how long has this boy been like this? When he already knew the answer. Because, again, this is why I say that everything is placed in Scripture on purpose. And so it's not even so much that Christ said it that's important, or the Father. It's the disciples who are basically writing down this textbook for us to say, pay attention. This is why oftentimes you hear in the Scripture, he with ears to hear, let him hear, meaning us. That statement, how long has he had it from childhood, is to reference this again, that these demons, these struggles, from when do they start? Childhood. We've been dealing with anxiety, worries, and the passions since our youth. And so this was very purposely put there so that we would be able to understand that this is not an acute problem, but a chronic problem. Yes. So I'll follow up with this prayer because you know it's interesting to see what I'm praying in there, God. Suffering and such. So I visit a lot of patients that still rely on you. They need some you know, improvement. I've had a few people from our own church that have gone through some measures and I said, Well, for you at this moment, we're praying, you can get better. Well, so, well, thanks, God. I appreciate it now. I'll get back to you uh, if I ever need you again. <laughs> and, um, and I made it uh, like my journey to be like, What's the purpose? There's a reason. Mm -hmm. And thank you. Yeah. So I need patience and I say, uh, and someone knows they're going to leave, they're going to leave that. Just don't forget the moment. Because pray, we pray, that we got to connect the fact that with these prayers. Now, the challenge is that uh, someone called me from New York said, Listen, you know, the closest one I know we got to pray over one of our basketball friends in the hospital is not doing well. And I'm praying. And I would think, I'm saying, listen, it's a lot on me to pray for someone to get well when it doesn't look very good, actually. But, you know, and I, and I actually texted him. But what was important for me was to let him know that I know him, I knew him well enough to play basketball, but he was so old, of course, he didn't feel welcome. And I was saying, well, I've been doing this for a long time. And I said, hey, I've been doing this for a long time. 
Mm -hmm. So prayer is actually important. Our prayer. But then people would think, well, I you know, I don't believe or I don't I'm upset or I've lost there's also the prayer didn't work or it's mm -hmm. not. It is working. And suffering has learned a lot about suffering. Uh, to the extent that I've got to read them a box. Absolutely. And there have been many instances where someone that seems to be exceptionally holy, uh, and I'm not just talking about people like St. Paisios or St. Nectarios that died of cancer, I'm talking about parishioners that were holy in their stature and the way that they bore their illness, and people wondered, how, why did they die? Why did God let such a holy, wonderful person die? And this is so myopic of us to basically look at this side of life and say, do you not realize that all of this is just a tiny little microscopic piece of eternity? They're victorious. They won. They have earned their victory crown. That is a glory for us because now they are part of the, uh, the, the, the choir triumphant, the church triumphant. We're still the church militant because we're still trying to save our souls. But they're part of the church triumphant. They've succeeded. And so it's very, very important that we pray. And, and this, uh, what you just mentioned, Ghost, I think is very, very important because many times people ask, well, why do you pray to saints? Why can't you just pray to God? <laughs> so why did you ask Costa to pray? <laughs> because you just acknowledge Costa's closer to God than you because Costa prays all the time. <laughs> so by that same token... Shouldn't we be praying to saints too? <laughs> so when anyone asks you, why do you pray to saints? Refer back to that because we see it in our own daily lives. That group prayer, communal prayer, corporate prayer is important. That when we are together, we're like a bundle of sticks. We're, we're impossible to break. We're like a bundle of candles. You can't just blow one of us out. So this is critical to our lives. It's very, very important that all of this is part of our journey. So I did not have him uh, introduce me, but I will have him give some closing uh, remarks of his own uh, life, because after all, as I like to point out, Father Simeon has been a priest for as many years as I have been alive. <laughs> Which means, no, not ouch, that means wisdom. <laughs> Now, he doesn't exactly have this, but I was reading Proverbs here that says, a hoary head is, the, is a beautiful thing. I'm gray enough. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to uh, cede the microphone to Father Simeon to leave us with some beautiful words of his wisdom and reflection. Well, you know, I think that one of the things that I have to emphasize is that I'm very happy with the turnout that we've had for the Presanctifieds and then this meal and study after it. So as you know, this is one of my favorite services. I look forward to each Lent. And it's one thing to do it by yourself. It's another thing to do it with a community. So I think that that's very important. And I've always sort of, you know, you, you've heard it a hundred times, that Great Lent is originally a catechetical season. It's a season that we indeed give instruction to people leading to baptism on the great baptismal feast, which is Pascha, the resurrection. The first dynastis is, is really the baptismal service of the early church. So I think that one of the sort of projects that we have and we've done and continually do is to reemphasize that catechetical notion or that teaching notion. So to just do this service, even with people there, and then to have them leave would be problematical. So what we're doing is we want you to, during this season, expand your understanding of the faith. In addition, of course, primarily to come closer to God. And we do our best to facilitate that through these classes. So you can count on this again next year. And maybe we'll plot and hatch something during the Nativity Fast or the Advent season, too, because this is a very good thing. So, of course, we have hospitality with Costa, who shakes his head. So, so primarily, I'm just delighted that you're here and you're indeed participating in this idea of growing in your faith and understanding. We'll work on that. <laughs> Thank you.
So in closing, we want to once again thank the Anne and Deirdre Phillips uh, Lecture Series Foundation for allowing us to do this. We would not be able to do these lecture series without their generous support, so we are very, very grateful uh, to the Phillips family and for everyone that has made this possible. We also want to say thank you to our parish council members, especially uh, Terry. You've been at all of them, haven't you? So Terry's been on Pangadi duty for literally every single pre-sanctified liturgy. So we are grateful to our parish council and for everyone that has made this possible. Uh, I love that every single service and every year it seems that we get more and more people. Uh, you can always get them food. <laughs> but it has been absolutely wonderful to share these experiences with you. As a reminder, although we do not have a Lenten lecture uh, next week, although I technically Father's uh, talk after the uh, service will probably count as a good lecture, uh, but we will have pre-sanctified next week. Uh, that will be the only service, however, next week because this Friday is the Akathis, so next week the only service will be on Wednesday night, the pre-sanctified liturgy. I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your Lent. Kali Anastasi. Yes. Yes.